Thanks for uh, missing out on some drunken uh, uh, adventures out there and coming out to this Shopify thing. I don't know what's going on with the presentation. Uh, just one second. Let's they're just delaying it. They're not skipping it. What's going on? I'll work off this for now. Uh, let's see if we can get rid of this ribbon. All right. So. All right. So. Uh, my name is Nadim Duba. As Sharif said, I am the founder of Red Canary. And uh, since this, the beginning of this year, Red Canary grew to three people. So yay. And very nervous as well, because it's a startup. Hopefully we can rent this office one day. Um, and right now I'm actually working as well in conjunction with Dan Lesage right there, looking at his phone. Dan, <laughs> at Squanto, we're doing fraud analytics, a very exciting venture. Uh, so we're both hiring. If you want to come up and take my business card or leave your contact with Dan, uh, please feel free to do so. Uh, sorry, Dan, I didn't ask for permission yeah. for you. <laughs> so today's talk is going to be BurpKit, using WebKit to own uh, the web. So uh, just a little bit about me. I just told you I was the founder, but before I made BurpKit and presented at, at DEF CON, I did a few other talks. Uh, one of them was Ploitego, which was this framework for exploiting uh, infrastructure using Maltego, this data visualization platform. The second was Canary Framework, which is now being used by a couple of Fortune 100s in the security space uh, for threat, an um, threat analytics and uh, uh, what do you call it, threat data feeds. And uh, my favorite one, even though it's a very small project, is PyMyProxy. Uh, the reason why it's my favorite is because it's being used at the Internet Archive, so that makes me really amped, you know? I get excited about these small geeky things. So, uh, uh, so today we're going to go over what WebKit is, why use it in your, in your tools, how you can use it in your tools, and then we're going to see how I used it in, in Burp Suite so that I could basically leverage the power of WebKit to do some really sophisticated things in web penetration testing. And then finally, we'll show you some demos, and then you get to ask any kind of question you want. So what's going on today? We have a big problem in web app pen testing. The problem is that we're still using scraping tools that are basically designed for the 1990s web. Everything that you could do back then in terms of like looking at a web page, the HTML, deciphering what's going on, you can't do today. A lot of these web pages are rendering themselves with tons and tons of JavaScript code. Like you see these Angular modules out there these days. If you're dealing with an Angular web app, good luck using a scraper and, and deciphering the meaning of this web app in your scraper. So the approach needs to be really dynamic. Um, so our tools are behind, basically. And what does our toolkit look like? Well, mostly our toolkit looks like Nikto, cool for reconnaissance. And on the attack side, we have Burp Suite, which has the very sad Lobo browser tab. And no JavaScript, no JavaScript support, Charles and Zed. And the only thing out there that actually has JavaScript support is WebSecurify's proxy.app, which is not really a security tool. It's more of a debugging tool. Um, so we really need to advance ourselves in this field. In fact, this is the only use case where Burp Suite's browser logo tab will actually render the page correctly in this very old Apache It Work demo page. It can't even render ASDF.com's sophisticated graphics with the animated ASDF going, on, going across. So we need to move forward. You know, we need to have modern web browser capabilities right in our toolkits. We need to start leveraging WebKit. It's open source. It's free. And it has a brilliant API. And most importantly, we need to figure out how our tools are going to interact dynamically with the domain object model that we see in web browsers today. So WebKit, what is it good for? So WebKit is the layout engine that's being used today. And most people attribute WebKit to 
uh, Safari in, in Apple's uh, version of their browser called Safari. Uh, but really, it was actually a fork from uh, KDE. And KDE initially started the uh, WebKit initiative back then, and then people like Apple and people like Google started picking up this project and really injecting a lot of innovation and power into the project. Today it actually uh, powers most, so most of the browser, browsers have taken the fork of WebKit again and done their own thing. And so we see different flavors of WebKit out there. In fact, Chrome is, is, is a big fork of WebKit. <coughs> and then the unofficial definition by the Gruck, the poet of security, WebKit is basically a collection of views after freeze that somehow managed to render HTML, probably via buffer overflow in WebGL. Yes, it is very vulnerable, and it's, it's got a ton of use after freeze. So what does it look like component-wise if we look at WebKit today? If you downloaded the WebKit DLL and you want to start playing with it, what are you going to actually be exposed to? There's two main components here. The first component is the JavaScript core. That takes care of you know, compiling JavaScript into, into, into uh, just-in-time code, uh, doing everything that has to do with JavaScript in terms of managing uh, the objects in the browser, sweeping dead objects from, from memory, and so on. The second one is the web core, which is actually the visual part of WebKit. That's the part that renders whatever you're doing, uh, you know, in the, in the web browser in terms of, like, styling a CSS element or placing a div somewhere here or there. That's WebKit. That's what it does. And there's also different add-ons to WebKit, like, things that inter interface with the debugger, for instance, like your web inspector. If we look at the known implementations and forks of WebKit, here's basically the most significant players in, in the space. We have Apple, like mentioned before, uh, Android, Nokia, Qt, so they have their own framework for WebKit, JavaFX WebView, that's native to Java 1.8 and above, uh, WebKit GTK, which is common in Linux, and we have the other ones like PhantomJS, Google Chrome, and so on, and it goes on and on and on. You can actually go to that URL and see maybe hundreds and hundreds of different implementations of this actual uh, API. So what are the pros and cons if we were to use WebKit? Well, the pros are that it has extremely widespread adoption. All the web developers out, out there, they're all designing your web pages for WebKit in some way or fashion. So. You know, you guarantee basically that your tool is going to be able to understand what's going on with the web pages that are being developed today. There's lots of language support. You know, every language that you can think of, Ruby, Java, Python, doesn't matter. Whatever you're strong at, you can use WebKit for your own, uh, your own purposes. And finally, we can actually programmatically interact with the DOM. And I'll show you how that's done later in WebKit. It's really neat. The cons are that just like anything else these days, you need more RAM, and the more complexity you have in these software components, the more vulnerable they are to attack. So WebKit, you know, especially with the Apple implementation of WebKit, has tons of use after fl uh, freeze, has tons of issues. So you have to be aware of that when you're using WebKit, let's say for maybe reconnaissance in dark web, or maybe on websites that are not so you know, uh, legit websites that deliver uh, drive-by downloads, so on, like, it's not the safest thing, right? In fact, if you were to, if you were a little bit braver than I was and you went for Chromium, you might be better off because actually Chrome has developed, or, or Google have developed a lot of technology around addressing the issue of use after freeze and so on. In fact, I was talking to a Google engineer. It was very interesting what they were telling me is that if you do find an exploit in Google Chrome, it will be found the next day and you will not be able to use it. And that's why Google Chrome, the exploit on the market, is very expensive. And it's, it's upwards of a million dollars. So if you find a really good Google Chrome exploit, keep it to yourself until you can find someone that pays good coin for it. Um, how can you use WebKit? Like I said, tons of language support. Go online, choose one, use it, you're going to be fine. It's all the same thing at the end of the day. So if you learn WebKit in one language, you'll be able to use the same principles that you've used in that language in other languages. 
There might be slight differences in the API, like maybe some missing features and so on. But in general, what you can do in Python is usually the same thing that you can do in all the other languages. So, burpkit. Burpkit brings burp suite and webkit together. What I did was I basically started trolling the web and looking around and you know I was really annoyed with the fact that uh, our tools were so far behind and I was looking for a way to implement webkit <coughs> and by chance you know it took me this re this project took me years of research because I was looking for a solution and by chance I came across the fact that suddenly Java had natively implemented webkit right into Java 1.8 and above so I decided to take on this challenge of actually bringing the real rendering engine of WebKit right into Burp Suite. Uh, if there's anybody here that's not familiar with Burp Suite, please raise your hand. I'll just give you a brief description. All right, so Burp Suite is the pen tester's pal in web application assessments. I'll just show you what it looks like. Basically, this is Burp Suite, uh, a whole bunch of really uh, ugly looking tabs that allow you to um, debug intercept requests, uh, decode requests, you know, make all sorts of sophisticated uh, injection attacks, and there's also, you know, a, a whole bunch of third-party plugins in the BAP store that you can download to augment your pen testing abilities. Again, that's me there. Woo! Still number one. All right. <laughs> so this is Burp, and we use this in the industry heavily. We, in fact. If you come across a pen tester and you own a business and you own, you, you're running, so, you're developing software, uh, web soft, web apps in particular, and someone doesn't come with Burp Suite, you should really be concerned. This is the de facto standard for web pen testing tools. Period. There's no other until I develop the other one. I'm just kidding. Uh, so, so yeah. So just to give you kind of an example, this is what we're looking at today when we're pen testing. So if I go to, sorry, I gotta look here. So if I go here to Google, ah. actually 443, and I looked at, uh, the page in Lobo, the render tab, this is what Google looks like. Pretty ugly. It's not Google, right? So big, big problem for the Web 2.0 apps. So, you know, going back to how we implemented the solution, and I'm going to show it to you in a second. There, were t there are kind of several leading web, web solution, WebKit solutions out there. There's one commercial one called Web, uh, sorry, uh, uh, JX Browser, which is developed by a Russian team, and it's actually pretty complete. It, it embeds Chromium right into your uh, into your apps, which is the more secure version of WebKit, and JavaFX. The difference is in costs. If you want to pay five thousand plus dollars and you want to build a commercial solution for web pen testing, JX Browser is a much better alternative to what's available in. Uh, Java native, but if you want to go with free and very decent, then uh, you can use Java, uh, Java's built-in version. The implementation. When I started implementing this, I came across many different problems. Uh, the problems mostly have to do with lack of documentation, like any other project. Um, you know, for, for the JavaFX uh, implementation of WebKit, we have several cons, One uh, pros. One is that it's portable across every platform that Java runs on. So Linux, Mac OS X, Windows, you name it, it's there. The other part of this is that it has a very clean Java-esque API, which means that if you're a Java programmer, you're gonna be very happy with the API that JavaFX gives you right out of the box. Whereas JX Browser, it's not going to give you such a clean API, but it's going to give you more power. It has a complete JavaScript bridge. And what I mean by that is that you can actually use this bridge to inject Java objects directly into the JavaScript DOM, which means that you can extend the functionality of WebKit within your implementation of it. 
So let's say you wanted to add you know, a function that calls a scanner remotely, you can do that with a JavaScript bridge. It leverages the Java URL framework, which means that it's hookable, which means that you can implement any kind of protocol you want, and it will go through. So let's say you called it foo colon slash slash. That's your scheme. You can implement any scheme you want and make it perform any kind of action based on that scheme. So that's something that was really important when I was building this, and I'll show you why. The cons are that the API is pretty incomplete because it's right now it's under rapid development. People are continuously adding to it features, performance boosts, so on, and there's a lot of little glitches in the GUI components. And the other part that sucks too is that there's no real GUI components for things like Web Inspector, the things that you are used to in a regular WebKit implementation like Safari and so on. You know, when you right click and you say inspect element, unfortunately those things are missing and you have to implement those visual details in your app yourself. The challenges. If you're familiar with Java, back then in the day, they came up with this GUI framework called Swing. And Swing was the start of GUI uh, for all Java apps. And unfortunately, when Burp came out, they started using, they developed it completely in Swing. The second problem that I came across was the, was the JavaFX web engine. Did not have load content with base URLs. So if you're familiar with WebKit, it has a function call where you can actually mock a request to a server. So basically the content is hosted right on your, on your PC, but you can say to WebKit, load this file from my PC as if it was coming from google.com. And the reason why that's important is because if you had, let's say, just the HTML on your own PC and you wanted to fetch everything else, like images, CSS, and so on, You'd want this function to be there. So in Burp, we'll see why this was a challenge. So challenge number one. The reason why I'm talking about these challenges, by the way, is because each of them took me like two months to fix. So it was no, it was no easy thing, and I don't want you guys to spend two months. Uh, Java effects, luckily the team implemented JFX panel, which allows you to embed J Java effects GUI components directly into Swing apps. That's a great thing, until you get to the point where you start to look at synchronous calls across the two frameworks. So what I mean by that is, if we're actually executing a function in the Swing framework, and we call across to the JavaFX framework, waiting for a result, and then the JavaFX framework goes on to call again something in the Swing framework, all in the same thread, and it's all synchronous, then you have two event loops that are waiting for the result, and nobody really doing anything. So there's a big deadlock. Um, so the key to this is really to prefetch resources in the, in, the, in the event loop that you're currently working in. So if there's things that you can fetch ahead of time in one loop, then do that in that loop instead of waiting for it to be done in an, in, in, at the end of the sequence. So it's kind of complex, but basically there's lots of wrapping code. And if any of you have that problem when you're developing this kind of solution, you can come to me and I can show you what I've done with uh, BurpKit. The this, this challenge here, the second challenge, the repeater tab. So I'll show you what I mean by the repeater tab for those of you who are not familiar. The repeater tab is this. And really the purpose of the repeater tab is to basically you know, change the input, press go, look at the output, see what happened, do we have an error, and then keep mutating the inputs until we find something, or maybe even just to debug a specific request. So what you want is really to see the result without reissuing the request. And this is where the load content with base URL comes in handy. If we don't have load base content without URL, with URL, sorry, uh, then at this point we, we're stuck reissuing the request live on the network. And for apps that use things like synchronizer tokens, where it's just a one-time thing, the request can only be done once, then we lose basically the result. We can't re-inspect that result. So that's not valuable to us. We want to be able to repeat whatever we're, we're, we're issuing here, whatever we're getting back in this tab in the real rendering process of WebKit. So the solution was to hook the URL 
uh, framework in Java. You remember I said it was hookable. So what I did there was I said, well, okay, so we're stuck reissuing requests right through the Java framework. So why not mock the fact that we're going out to the internet? So I set up this hook where I said, if we're repeating the re re this request, let's, let's cache the response. And then whenever we see the, ish the, the request being reissued, we'll basically retrieve the content from the cache instead of going out to the internet and, and fetching it back. But that meant we had to implement new handlers. And for those of you who are going to go hardcore, this is basically the interface that you would, the minimum interface that you would actually have to implement uh, to fake responses in the Java, uh, in the Java URL framework. So I'm not going to uh, dive deep into this, but basically the, the one thing that we were, and, and the only way that you can actually identify cached content is by modifying the user agent header because the JavaFX WebKit implementation does not allow you to change any other headers in the requests. So that's the only request header that you can do. And the way that I tag it is basically taking a SHA-1 hash of the request that's issued. And so when I see the user agent with that SHA-1 hash, I know where in the cache it lies and I just fetch the content from that cache. So the final product, after all that boring stuff, right? Let's see, are you ready? So this is Google. This is Google with WebKit. Yay, we can see our little green guy dancing. Isn't that great? <laughs> right? And you can see here that we can, we can change things so that you, you see that the cache doesn't get in the way. I forgot what the, yeah, let's do that. Oh, whoops, I'm used to a browser now. So there you go, you see that the query comes through. You can modify it to your heart's uh, delight and you'll see the results and this, you can guarantee that this is the response that came back and it's never being reissued. So that's uh, WebKit. Now, not so exciting, I understand. I need to dance a bit more before you guys clap. Uh, so let's do a little GUI walkthrough. So, all right. So I'm gonna sit down now. <clears throat> All right, so you'll see here that, and I'm gonna see if I can increase the resolution, sorry, because it's too small. Uh, let's see if we can go up again. No. Come on, come on, come on, yes. All right. All right, so. Let me show you a bit about the, uh, the GUI. So on the bottom here, you may have noticed that this was open before. What it gives you is a JavaScript console, just like anything else. I don't know why it's doing that. Uh, where you can type in your JavaScript and do all sorts of, hmm, I wonder what's going on here. And you can do all sorts of things to interact with the top panel. So whatever contents in the top panel, you can actually interact with it in the bottom panel, just like you would in a regular browser. Not a big deal. Uh, the part that's nice though, that I find is, is kind of slow in web pen testing, is let's say that you're testing for cross-site scripting. What do you usually do when you test for a cross-site script? What is the number one thing web pen testers try to always do? What's that? Do a JavaScript alert. Do a JavaScript alert, right? Like, hello. We want to see that it's actually, it's, it's actually rendering. So you'll notice that the first time that I did alert, we, like, unlike a traditional web browser, I didn't get back a pop-up box that said alert. Because, you know, when we're doing web pen testing, trust me, doing okay a thousand times is not pleasant. It gets, you, it's get, it gets on your nerves. So, you know, I wanted to basically streamline the process and only provide basically that pop-up box when it counts, when you want to take the money shot, which is a screenshot. So let's do that alert one more time. I don't know why it's not typing down there, by the way. Okay, fine. Do all the bugs today for me. So I'm gonna toggle this little button at the top here, which basically says toggle on all alerts. And so if I do that and I press enter, now you're gonna see the JavaScript alert. And now if I wanna take the money shot so I can prove to the client that they, they've made a boo-boo, we can take the screenshot. It's dated and timed, save it, 
go to your you know, save folder, take a look, and there it is. Isn't that great? Tough crowd. <laughs> All right, so now the other part of this, that's beautiful. So a lot of the times we assess really complex apps. We have apps that are like multi-tiered. You know, you have the admin, the user, the guest, so on. Everybody does something and everybody has a different view. And a lot of the times what we tend to see is that, uh, you know, sometimes a website might be used for the actual product and part of another website somewhere in the infrastructure is actually analyzing the behavior or the, uh, of the users on that product. So they're collecting logs, they're analyzing logs, they're looking around, seeing, seeing what you know, part of the web pages they're hitting and so on. So how do we actually track that if we have a cross-site script that propagates from the main app to some back-end infrastructure? And in fact, if you look at some of the attacks you know, in the past, what people are doing is they're basically randomly injecting in any form they can on the web, things like the Beef uh, XSS framework hoping that someone in the back end who's running analysis, anal analytics and admin function is going to open that up on their vulnerable admin side and they'll get a shell back. So how do we actually track that? Because that's an actual, you know, very hard problem when we're looking at things like stored XSS. How much does this stored XSS actually affect the rest of the web application? So this is where I'm going to go and I'm going to just pretend so bear with me here and, and just pretend that we're going through this scenario together. So I'm on Google. I find that Q is you know, vulnerable to um, cross-site scripting. So what I do is I'm going to taint. So let's say I'm injecting this cross-site scripting and it actually works. I'm going to taint um, this parameter. And when I press go, it'll, you know, let's assume that it comes up and it says alert. So now how do I actually know that this, how bad this cross-site script is. The way we do this is that, okay, so now I've tainted this value, I'm keeping track of this. Let's go to another website, asdf.com, for instance. Let's, uh, let's pretend that asdf.com is our admin side. Of Google. Let's press enter. Come on, come on, internet. Oh, oops. Okay, so here we have ASDF.com. Let's pretend this is our admin side, and let's pretend that that value, and I'm not sure why this is happening. This is kind of disappointing. <coughs> Must be the update I ran this morning. Uh, so let's pretend that that value actually got alerted. Right? Oops. What did I do? Oh. Let's pretend. All right. Third time is a charm. So let's pretend that that came up in our admin side. So now I want to assess how bad that taint, where did it come from? You know, I want to know why it happened. So there's an XSS tracker tab here for stored XSS. You can see here that our taint value that we injected earlier has showed up in this table. And it's telling us that this, or this taint originally came from you know, google.ca and now it's showing up in asdf.com. So now imagine taking this on an enterprise app and going through the entire app, injecting things all over the place, then revisiting the other part of the app with burp. You'll finally get basically a tree and a log of where these XSS uh, instances popped up in your entire enterprise app. Very handy. This is something that saves a lot of time for us when we're doing pen tests. So I'm going to just restart Burp just because there's a lot of artifacts going on here on the screen. And I'm not sure if it's just because of the resolution here. Any questions so far, by the way, if I'm going too far or over anything? No? All right. All right, and there's another update. All right, so, so that's a short and brief overview. And you know, when we showed this to uh, Apple, this is what they had to say, John, I was very impressed. 
I'm just kidding. Um, so, you know, one more thing. Yes, I have to do the Apple thing, sorry. And one more thing. Uh, we now can develop Burp Suite plugins in JavaScript. This is a big thing for me because I've always dreamt of being able to do things as sophisticated as say that I'm, you know, going through, so the way we usually do the pen test is that we've got Firefox going, we go google.com or whatever, whatever site that we're using as our, uh, as our uh, target. And then we push everything through Burp Suite. And so what you're seeing here is the interceptor, which basically gives me the opportunity to modify the request. But I'm going to just let things go. But imagine that while I'm going through this exercise of actually going and you know pen testing and doing things, imagine JavaScript hooking onto these web pages, opening them up, inter interpreting them, sending them to different components in your network, sending them to different tabs in Burp Suite doing JavaScript things with those web pages, right? Like injecting jQuery and then using jQuery to parse the results and parse out different elements of the page. So let me show you an example of where that's useful, for instance. The number one thing that we always do in a web, in, in an enterprise pen test is we, what, what is the number one thing actually? Let me ask you that. I don't want it to be all me. Go on guys, give me some suggestions. What do you do when you do pen tests? Anybody, don't be shy. First of all, maybe a threat or vulnerability assessment based on the existing infrastructure. Sure, the vulnerability like, assessment is part of it, but before that... Like more of a people book. How do you... Sorry? It, it's more of a people book kind of thing. It's more of a... People work kind of a thing before we get started with it. Paperwork? Well, I mean, <laughs> after the paperwork, bef how do you find out what targets you're actually hitting? You can create a scale. And map. And map, and map. And map which Perfect. comes back to reconnaissance. But we also not only target infrastructure in pen tests, we target individuals because the human, uh, hu the human brain is the biggest vulnerability in any organization. Like social engineering kind of stuff? Sure, but in order to social engineer people, we need to know who they are and who they work for, right? We need to know who works for X before we actually gather some kind of human intelligence. So what's the best site for that? Uh, perhaps LinkedIn or two? Bingo, LinkedIn. So let's do LinkedIn. Let's go to LinkedIn, and since we're at Shopify, let's look at who works at Shopify. Don't worry, guys. I'm not gonna hack you. Uh, LinkedIn. All right. So let's sign into LinkedIn. Let's take a look. People who worked at Shopify. All right, let's see. 992 results. I don't know about you, but if I wanted a CSV, I'm not going to go through 992 results by hand. So I created this handy scraper that basically takes everything that you see in, in LinkedIn and spits it out to a CSV file. So let's press play. Let's save our results. And save. All right, and let's look at it in action. You see it scrolling through the lists automatically. Let's take a look at what the result is when in our CSV. And you'll see here, I've got a nice CSV with the names of the individuals and what they do at the organization, all in a matter of seconds. So this is a great example of how you can use WebKit. This is a nice position. I think I should go for this one next. All right. So that's one example. There are plenty of other examples in, uh, in, in, in the, in the uh, repo that, that I've provided in this, in this project. If we look at the other scrapers, there's scrapers for Zoom Info, which is another LinkedIn. There's a Twitter followers scraper, so the infinite scroll problem that everybody has. I've automated that. Uh, there's also a scraper for Jigsaw, which is um, uh, Salesforce's LinkedIn slash contact database. Uh, one of the, the other things that I like to do, so 
Once we found the individuals, how do we know what their passwords are when we go on, uh, on, on, web, on, on web portals that may be available to us? Like, let's say that Shopify has Outlook Web Access open to the world. How do I know what Jeremy's password is at Shopify, right? Well, it turns out that the human brain has a tendency to pick things like Shopify rocks, uh, you know, or winter 15, whatever they see in front of them, whatever they think right away. And it's mostly the things that are right in front of them, right? So it's winter, you know, most of the times, 4% of the time, 4% of the individuals that I collect in one scrape will usually have something seasonal like winter 15, summer 16, so on. But then you have the other 3%, you know, I did, I did a pen test for a pizza place and it was so funny. It was like pepper 2015. Pizza, uh, pizza, you know, uh, exclamation, exclamation. So it's really predictable. So how do you do that? Well, I've included a web spider module. And the web spider basically goes, you can point it to a website, and it'll basically extract all of the words from that website and create a word list for you. So let's do that with Google.com. The reason why I'm doing it with Google.com is because Google, if you've ever tried to scrape Google, it's purely a JavaScript web page, and you'll not be able to do it easily. You won't be able to find most of the links in Google. So one of the things that I'm going to show you now is that it, it changes the way traditional JavaScript, uh, 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 JavaScripts run. I've added this one feature here at the bottom, which basically says every time when you toggle it on, every time you load a page, run the script. So what we've done here is we've basically created this huge loop over basically on page events. So every time the page loads, invoke the script and we can basically loop through any website recursively. So let's do that. I'm, I'm going to just show you because if you want to try it at home, you basically have to set up your target scope. So this is what your crawler will stay within these two websites. And you can do actually sophisticated patterns here. You can actually say, I want every file that starts with A or whatever, you know? And then what you can do is just press play and, okay, what happened here? Prompt disabled. Ah, okay, so there we go. Yes, so now it's crawling Google by itself. And we've created a spider, this web spider now, is less than 90 lines, all on your PC, running on top of WebKit, and you can configure it to do screenshots. And if I remember where I saved the word list, so you can see. So the word list is wordlist.txt under the home directory. So you get to take a look at my loot. And there it is. I've got a Google dictionary that I can base my password attacks off. Right? So another cool feature of WebKit, pen tests, right? Uh, Wow, this is a tough crowd. I don't know what I have to do. I don't know what I have to do, you guys. Does Nasaki do it for you? I don't know. All right, so there's lots more to see, and I, and I showed you a lot of these things. The last thing I want to show you here is how you can actually interact with, uh, uh, what's it called? Hello, it's me. No? All right. Uh, how you can have a JavaScript plugin. So here I've, I've basically, um, uh, I'll show you here. So the burp script, script IDE, by the way, there's two things. There's a burp script IDE at the bottom here. I forgot to mention in the, this in the GUI walkthrough. And for things that are more app-centric, like if you didn't care about what the web browser looks like, and you want to create something that was just a generic scraper with no actual front end, this, there's a burp script IDE for that. So you can actually develop uh, your burp extensions in here. And what I'm going to load here is I'm going to just load a very simple one because the other ones need some a bit of setup. And so this will just say hello world. It'll just give me a hello world dialog box. Just as proof for those of you who are uh, burp aficionados. So there's my plugin written in JavaScript. And if I click it, it says hello right here. And by the way, it's not limited to just such a simple example. Like I said, in, uh, in the repo, if you go there and take a look, we've got tons of examples that cover every scenario 
uh, of a burp plugin that can be written in JavaScript. So I've done the whole API. There's complete coverage in JavaScript for the entire burp API. Um, so the sky's the limit, really. It's up to you. All right. So I actually skipped a few slides because I was really amped, but and you guys were a hard crowd. But uh, so you know what I've demonstrated here, and and you know, just we'll just ignore this slide here. Let me just go through. All right. So what we've demonstrated here is that we are able to power to use the power of WebKit. What, hopefully what I've shown here will give you an idea of what you can do with WebKit. Uh, in my case, because I was using Burp and because I was using Java, I had a limited API and I came across several different challenges. The challenges with, you know, deadlocks when we're going across threads, the challenges with the fact that we didn't have a load base with URL. But these same challenges don't exist in different versions or different language implementations of the same API. So if you look at uh, actually the API, and if you're comfortable with Python, Python has a more comprehensive bridge to WebKit. You can do anything you want. And really, as an industry where we need to go, we need to basically take all of the tools that we've built today and adapt them to the, new t the future. Bas what, we're, what we're looking at today, we need to get things like Nikto doing things with WebKit. We need to get things like Nmap, if it's doing screenshots of websites, doing things with WebKit. The sky's the limit. We need to go in this direction, and I hope that if you're building the, your next security tool that's gonna power the web app penetration testing industry, that you will be using WebKit, as I've demonstrated today. Uh, and I'm always open to your ideas, your contributions, so please, if you have you know, the urge to contribute to this project. I'd be more than happy to, you know, listen to these ideas and have you part, part of that repository uh, to make this better. In fact, uh, there's people out there that really want to pay for this, even though it's open source and they want to basically fund a project. But it's not, not enough uh, to do it on your own. We need a team and really, I'm not saying that I'm gonna make a product, but I mean, if you guys come here and say, 50 of you want to develop, burp kit further let's do it next startup forget shopify right uh so anyways yeah so that's about it i mean i hope i i uh uh showed you guys some cool stuff um and didn't take away some time from uh, uh st pat's but just want to say thanks to my lovely wife and baby uh justin seitz who's a great pen tester uh he's always been very valuable to me in terms of feedback and and industry knowledge. Uh, he's got a great website called Automating OSINT, so you can actually learn OSINT techniques with Python and Elasticsearch, and uh, maybe even implement a few BurpKit uh, plugins. Uh, Dirk Lieberman, who's a fantastic guy, he actually did this for free, so I, did, I forgot to show this as well in the GUI walkthrough, uh, but uh, thanks to Dirk. Uh, in in BurpKitty, so for things like SQL injection, where we're, uh, it's blind SQL injection, and we want to basically understand, um, sorry, we want to understand if we found something. He implemented this graphical representation of the timeline in uh, JavaFX. It's open source as well. Very, very nice of him to do that. And, uh, you know, Thomas Makula for the autocomplete, and finally the other guys like JavaFX team, they did a great job with that uh, thing, and I'm very happy that. Uh, we were able to implement some, uh, the beast in Burp Kit. Um, so, anyways, that's it for me, guys. Questions? So, um, so what they've done, no, so what you're actually doing is you're injecting an instance of a Java object directly into the DOM. So it actually can interact, because JavaScript has an object-oriented, very hackish one, but the model, it's, it can interact well with uh, Java. The only problem, the only limitation you'll face is that if you're actually interacting with Java objects in JS Engine, uh, if, there, if the author of the object, or the class, sorry, does not properly adjust the visibility of the class, like say, say public, 
uh, you'll get things like reflection errors and access denied and so on. So there are still a little few quirks that you have to pay attention for, but nothing that you can't get around with a proxy wrapper. So any other questions? Come on, come on. <laughs> I saw you first. Go ahead. I was just wondering like, how it actually keeps a track of the cross edge scripting from the one piece to Sure. So what it does is when you t you say taint in the right in the context menu, it actually keeps track of that taint value, taint to zero, in a database in a in a key uh, a key value hash map. Okay. And so whenever so is this database or something is confined to within the infrastructure way? It's confined to BurpKit. So to, to burp suite it's a java java hash map okay. and what it does is basically it listens for an alert so when an alert triggers with that taint value in it that's when it knows that it's gotten uh it's 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 not the most ideal thing and there's many flaws to that approach but at least it's a starter because a lot of times when you're doing cross-site scripting you can invoke an alert no problem so that's why I chose to hook onto alert and basically inspect the value and see if it's the actual taint value. Okay, so when you were scraping uh, LinkedIn, yeah. is it dependent on the current layout of the website? No, so, there are, so one of the things that it does is, oh, well, yes and no. Uh, so uh, yes, you have to adjust your jQuery strings if they change the, the design, but that particular scraper has been working for me for two years, so it hasn't, cause me any problems. Uh, with jQuery around, it's dead easy to actually enumerate elements on the page. And if jQuery is not injected in the page, say by LinkedIn, let's say they picked something else, I have uh, burp kit functions, there's an API and a documentation where you can dynamically inject libraries like jQuery, um, uh, some of the, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, NPM, Node.js modules, like CSV5, uh, there's a whole bunch of things that I've put in there, crypto modules, so on, that you can actually inject. And you can, you, you can do a lot of neat things. Uh, and if it's not there, the, the source code's free and open source, so you can, you can extend it to your heart's delight. So have you used this on the mobile device? Burp Suite doesn't, no. doesn't run on a mobile device. But what you can do is you can intercept. Modify? Sorry? You could use a modification? No, it won't run. Uh, so. It might run on something that has Java, but I don't think it'll run good, and I'm not sure if that's supported, so I don't know. Even if it's a browser that's running on the mobile? So this is not based on a browser, it's based on, it's an OS app. So it's independent of the browser. We've actually, since you didn't know where we started using Burkett, that's really been instrumental in advancing test given how much you know, JavaScript is used out there. Um, what's next? What's next? Your ideas <laughs> next Take over the world. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I mean, it all comes down to time and contribution, right? Um, this, these projects, they're not easy to do. You know, solo, solo effort, like I said, two years research, six months implementation. Uh, the research was purely to see how we can get around the limitation of not having WebKit in Java. And then finally they came up with it. I was working on tons of stuff trying to get like even just native WebKit into Java and it was very kludgy. So I, I didn't follow up, but eventually this came around and I was like, wow, this is great. Six months, put it in, put it at DEF CON, it was good. But that's six months, one person and one person going to 4 a.m. And I can't do that all my life. So I need people like you, you know, so... Um, the next step is really to, you know, encourage you guys to get into the open source game. There's, you know, there's a lot of fun that can be had in the open source game. There's a lot of cool tools. We're doing a lot of cool things with open source tools at Squanto even, and at Red Canary. I mean, incredible the amount of, of stuff that's available to people today. So it's not very difficult to get your hands in the game. And I highly encourage it, for sure. So the next step really is, please, if you're interested, join the club and become a, an open source developer. And if you're using it commercially, you know, I, I highly recommend that you bring your guys that are developers to give ideas. Just the ideas are even very, very important to projects, you know, so things that could help, approaches, whatever, bugs, you, you just tell us, I don't bite, tell us <laughs> right now. So I don't bite, so, you know, 
and and yeah so that's my github repo uh, there's a ton of projects there there's even more than just burp kits so you guys can take a look at what I've been up to uh, and uh, Twitter I'm on there as well and Skype if you'd like to have just a one-on-one -on -one chat and see how we can do things uh, differently um, and yeah, our website, open anytime. We're pen testers, we're hackers, so if your org is looking for people, third party, independent, uh, we're, we're around town. And as I said before, uh, with Squanto, uh, we're doing fraud analytics right now, which uh, is a very big problem for the industry. So if you guys are interested in that as well, we're looking for data scientists. Um, what else then? We're looking for everything. Big data server developers. Yeah, so, you know, Definitely a lot of opportunities. And for those of you who don't want to ask questions and want to ask them later, I have business cards here that you can all go for. Please, no rush. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, so that's about it. So yeah. Right, thanks again, Nadim. No problem. Uh, just a quick reminder, next month, uh, it's going to be April 21st, third Thursday of the month, and the talk is about introduction to penetration testing using exact for the